Over these past several weeks, it has been a real joy to have my brother, Bob, come and share uh, the messages with us. And this morning, we conclude the series uh, with the title message, Mary Didn't Know. Thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you these, these mornings throughout the Christmas season. It has been really a, a great blessing, and I appreciate the opportunity to be back in a pulpit after a few years of uh, kind of having an administrative role uh, within the church. So it's, it's good to be able to share with you and, and to bring these messages to you. I've shared with you before that I love that song that we heard earlier, Mary, Did You Know? And... and a few years ago, the Lord just got a hold of my heart and said, you know, ponder that for a minute. Um, and not only did Mary not know what she was getting into, which we're going to talk about today, but as we have seen over the last five weeks, none of the characters in this story knew what, was, what they were facing and what was going to be happening in their existence and in their lives. And in that truth lies a great lesson for us that we often don't know what's going on. And we don't know the twists and the turns that, that God knows because he knows the beginning from the end and he knows the twists and turns we're going to face, but, but we don't. And so it takes great faith to walk with him. This time of year, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll, I'll rush out to my car. I have, my mom has this really beautiful Buick that keeps, stays in the garage. <clears throat> I have a little Volkswagen Beetle, it's 22 years old, and uh, it's just the kind of the minimal thing we could get when we came back from Europe. And uh, I'll run out to get in the car some mornings when it's like this, and I'll rush out and I'll sit down on a rock hard cold seat, and I'll turn on the engine, I'll look up, and I can't see a thing. You know what I'm talking about? You get that frost on the windows, and you look all around you, and you can't see in any direction nothing except white frost everywhere. And so if you're in a rush, you, you quickly get out you know, a credit card or something and try to scratch a little area so you can see, and you turn the heat up, but it's just blowing cold air, and, and you've got to get to where you're headed, and so you start driving down the road like this, right? Just barely, barely able to see out, out the window. If you, if you wear glasses, sometimes you'll come in from outside, if you're like me, and you'll walk into a warm place and immediately whoo, everything fogs over, right? And you get this tiny little vision of what you can see through the, the fog on your glasses. That's kind of what the story of Christmas has become for us, sadly. It, it's so crowded with, with legend and with images that, that, that just try the best to make Christmas look like a Christmas card when it really didn't look like that at all. It was, it was a tough experience for all of the characters who were involved in it. Their lives that were just going along normal from the, from the shepherds to the wise men to Mary and Joseph, every one of them, their lives were just going along normal and suddenly everything just got turned on its head. And it wasn't always comfortable. Sometimes it was fabulous. But sometimes, as we have seen, it was difficult. And the same is true for Mary, that Kevin just read part of the story we have of her from the Gospel of Luke. Mary was a very young girl. Anthropologists tell us that in the first century in Judea and throughout Israel, girls entered into the arranged marriages that were common and were normal then, as young as about 15 or 16 years of age. Uh, lifespans were shorter, people grew up faster, and, and that's the way it was. Her parents would have likely informed her very recently of the arrangement they had made with Joseph, the local village carpenter, that the two of them would be husband and wife. After a, a formal engagement ceremony, Mary, who would now be known as Joseph's wife, would have gone back to her parents' home to prepare for her life as a faithful wife and mother, 
while Joseph went back to his parents' home to prepare a place for her. Traditionally and normally in those circumstances, Joseph would have added a room onto his parents' house and welcomed her then at a later time into the family and into that home. And just parenthetically, if you jump to John chapter 14 when Jesus says familiar words to us, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. There are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come and take you to myself. That's an image from the engagement and marriage portion of their culture. Jesus was saying, I'm going to go back to dad's place and put on a room and I'm going to have you come and join me there as my bride. Okay, that's, that's the image. And it's, it's cool to think about that way. And that's what Joseph was doing. He was preparing a place for uh, Mary to come. Mary is preparing to go and to live with her husband and to be wife and mother. It was usual, normal existence for young people in their place in that time. Life was just going along normally. And it was sometime during that year of engagement, that year of preparation, that Mary's ordinary experience was interrupted by an extraordinary encounter with an angel of the Lord. Notice carefully the words that Gabriel uses to describe Mary in the text that Kevin read for us. You who are highly favored, you have found favor with God. When Luke wrote what he describes himself as an orderly and scholarly life of Jesus, he wrote it in Greek. He was writing it to a Greek audience, his, his own background. And the Greek word that we have translated in our Bibles as favored or favor from God is the Greek word charis. And it means grace-filled, touched by grace, the recipient of grace, to be blessed, to be encircled by grace. The grace is at the center of that word blessed and most blessed. Gabriel tells Mary in that series of sentences that she has been chosen in God's sovereignty to be the beneficiary of great blessings from him. It is not because she is somehow deserving of it, because then it wouldn't be grace. It is solely based on the sovereign choice of God Almighty. Mary is to be the recipient of God's grace. The angel tells Mary that her cousin, Elizabeth, is also a recipient of God's grace. And when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, she also recognizes that Mary has been a recipient of grace. Elizabeth greets her by saying, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. Blessed, same word, charis, at its root. Later, she says, blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has told her and all that will be accomplished. And Mary knows that she has been the recipient of grace, too, because she responds by singing praise to God in Luke chapter 2, verses, or 1, verses 45 to 55, 45, 6 to 55. In 48, she says, from now on, all generations will call me Blessed the recipient of grace, Charis. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. What a blessing Mary is receiving. Just as we mentioned when we talked about Joseph a few weeks ago, God in his sovereignty and his all-knowing supreme existence is able to scan the entire width and breadth of human existence. He knows every person who would ever be born and ever live. And he looks through that entire history and from the whole human race, he picks this, this teenage girl from a no-name village called Nazareth to be the recipient of the grace that is supreme, that she would be able to bear his own son. She is highly favored and blessed like no one else in history. But with that amazing blessing comes a tremendous burden. 
With the grace of selection by God comes the cost of following God. When Mary said, all generations will call me blessed, she was almost right. Because there was one generation that didn't. Her generation. Those people living right then and right there at that time. They called her some things, but it wasn't blessed. There was scandal that surrounded her. And when she was chosen by God to be the one to to give birth to His own Son, she was also selected to be the object of suspicion and gossip and ridicule among her own family, among the man that she was engaged to, and among the people of her village. Think for a moment, honestly, separate yourself if you can from the, the, the Christmas card images that you have of Christmas. Separate yourself from all that you already know that we, just, we could recite most of this story without even thinking about it, but put yourself in the shoes for just a moment of Mary's parents. They were no different than you or me. I've got a daughter. She, was, she, she and her family drove over from New York to be with us this weekend. I can't imagine my daughter at 16 coming to me and saying, Mom, Dad, I'm going to have a baby. <clears throat> but I've never had sex. Uh-huh. Sure. And an angel came and told me that this is a miraculous child, and, and it's going to be the Son of God, and you have to believe me. Oh, okay, sure. Think about that. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine how you would respond if that was your daughter telling you that wild tale. Put yourself in Mary's shoes. Not being believed. We noted four weeks ago how Joseph reacted when Mary told her the story. She returns from a three-month visit to her cousin Zacharias and Elizabeth when he, she learns that her cousin is going to have a baby who would become John the Baptist. And we are told there in Luke's account of the story that she was found to be pregnant. You remember that? Found to be pregnant. Uh-oh, that's a discovery. Oh, wow, she comes back from this trip and she's got a baby bump. What's going on? Joseph felt all the emotions you would expect, shock, disappointment, anger, fear, confusion. His family and friends, the whole village of Nazareth would have demanded to know what's going on and, and they would have encouraged Joseph to, to get what is rightly his, to get, ju- to get justice for the horrible crime that's been committed against him by this woman. Imagine how Mary felt at that same time. Would she have to go it alone? The angel didn't say, oh, and by the way, I'll tell Joseph it'll be okay. We don't have anything in here that says that. She didn't know what was going to happen. Would she have to go it alone? Who who was going to support her and her baby? This was not like now. She couldn't go out and get a job working at the Dollar Tree. She was, going to, was she going to be left completely on her own? It's likely that the only people that she knew in her entire existence lived there in Nazareth, a tiny little village. Maybe, maybe that family member that lived over in Cana that she went to the wedding of later, which is just you know a neighboring community. But everybody she knew was right there, and they all knew the scandal. So who was she going to turn to? Where was she going to go for help? Maybe the fact that everybody in the village knew and everybody in the village thought it was scandalous is the reason why Mary and Joseph stayed in Bethlehem after the baby was born. They made their way to Bethlehem, remember, because of the the census that was going to be taken. But it appears that they stayed there after the baby came, because when Matthew tells us the story of the wise men coming, it's pretty apparent from the story that some time had passed. The, the account tells us in Matthew's gospel that when the wise men arrived in the city, 
they were told to go to Bethlehem, and when they did, they went to the house where Mary and the baby were. And, and the word isn't baby that's used, it's child. It's a, it's a totally different word than Luke, than Luke uses to describe the birth of Christ. And based on the account from the wise men, Herod ordered all the children, all the boys in Bethlehem two years and under to be killed. So is it possible that Mary and Joseph stayed two years in Bethlehem after the birth? Maybe. A lot of biblical scholars think so. At least some time was spent there. Why do you suppose that is? Maybe going back to Nazareth wasn't that desirable because of all the scuttlebutt and all the gossip that was going on there. Even after they left and went to Egypt, when the angel warned them of what Herod had planned for the two-year-old boys in Bethlehem, they went to Egypt and they stayed there. And when the angel said, okay, the coast is clear, you can go back now, Joseph wanted to settle in the southern part of the country again, down there around Bethlehem, Israel, Judea, rather than go back to the north to Nazareth. But an angel said, nope, or no, he heard that Herod's son was on the throne down there in Judea and decided to go back to the only other place he knew, the only other place where he could set up shop, and that was back to Nazareth. And so that's where they headed. And so Jesus was raised in Nazareth, in that community where the scandal took place. Have you ever noticed that gossip never dies? Old rumors and unfair labels tend to stick with a person throughout their lives. And the same was true with Mary. Years later, with an increased spotlight on Jesus, her firstborn, the old rumors were dug up. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the political and religious leaders of the Jewish nation, started slinging mud at Jesus because he was ruffling their feathers. He wasn't behaving the way they thought he should. And in John chapter 8, during a rather ruthless battle of words between Jesus and those political religious leaders, they challenged him repeatedly, on and on, trying to destroy his credibility, trying to trip him up on some point of law or politics. And at the end of the debate, as Jesus is building steadily his claim that he is the Son of God, the Pharisees get more and more nasty in their accusations until finally they yell out, we are not illegitimate children of a loose woman. We are children of Abraham. And by drawing the contrast, they're saying, you are exactly that. You are exactly the child of fornication. You are exactly the child of an immoral woman. Do you suppose Mary was maybe there that day when they said those words to Jesus? It's possible. But whether she was there or not, she certainly heard about it. Here it is, 30 years later, and the suspicion and the accusations are still swirling around. In our day, the 21st century, we are used to a common tactic among politicians and people who are competing for popularity of digging up rumors and past histories of people and splashing it out there for the people to see, to discredit someone that they don't like. So we can imagine what they're doing. Imagine the pain that that must have been for Mary. Where do you suppose those Pharisees and Sadducees got their information? Where do you suppose they would have heard that 30 years earlier there was some question about the circumstances of his birth? Those same people in Nazareth that were still remembering, oh yeah, yeah I remember she came back from that trip, and oh, whoa. Such is the life of a woman who the angel described as highly favored. Here's the legacy of one who is blessed among all women. Back shortly after that first Christmas, in fact, just a week later, Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. And while they were there, they met a man named Simeon. 
who was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he said these words to them as they entered into the temple. This child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. (laughs) Imagine what that must have been like for Mary and Joseph carrying this infant child, and this stranger comes over and starts talking about how powerful and important their child was going to be, this little baby. And then he turned to Mary, and he said, A sword will pierce through your own soul also. That memory stayed with Mary. She shared it with Luke, and he included it in his gospel account. And that soul piercing that Simeon referred to began early, and it continued throughout her faithful walk with God. Think about the challenges that Mary faced in her life. From the day that that angel showed up in Nazareth, fast forward nine months, or three months, excuse me, to the public discovery of her pregnancy. We've talked about it at some length. Suspicion, accusation, judgment, rejection. This is what it means to be grace-touched? This is what it means to be blessed? From the day that that angel showed up in Nazareth, fast forward nine months, and now you're in a, a stable In Bethlehem, no room, no bed, a cave for livestock, and a a stone carved trough filled with hay as a place to lay the newborn baby. This is what it means to be the recipient of God's grace? Fast forward from the day that angel showed up in Nazareth, 30 years to the public ministry of Jesus and the public accusations and suspicions about her past. Opening up old wounds, judgmental stares all over again, and this time all over Jerusalem and all over the whole country because of the reputation that Jesus was building. This is what it means to be highly favored. From the day that that angel showed up in Nazareth, fast forward 33 years to the foot of a Roman cross blood. Rivers of blood. The nearly unrecognizable form of her firstborn son gasping out words in unbelievable torment and pain. This is the one who will reign on the throne of his father David forever? This is God's plan? Exactly. Mary didn't know. When Gabriel showed up and startled her with his amazing news, she had no idea all that was to come. Which makes her faithfulness all the more impressive. I do not disrespect Mary by asserting that she didn't know what lay ahead. In fact, I marvel at the fact of this young teenage girl who trusted God through it all and stands as an amazing example for us of how to be faith-filled in the midst of your world just absolutely falling apart. It's incredible. It's an amazing story. So let's notice two profound truths about Mary. First of all, Mary's identity before God did not change with her shifting circumstances. Her identity before God did not change with her shifting circumstances. When nobody believed her story, she was still highly favored. When Joseph was thinking of divorcing her quietly, she was still the most blessed among all women. It didn't change. When 30 years later people were still accusing her, she was still the one that all generations would call blessed. The circumstances didn't change who she was in God's eyes. And secondly, the reality of her blessing was not altered by the weight of her burden. God had selected her from all the women in human history and poured his grace out on her like no other person. The word 
had become flesh within her. It had matured in her virgin womb and had been delivered through her to save the world. No circumstance, no difficulty, no confusion could change God's plan. When life seemed to go in all sorts of senseless direction, she had the certainty to believe that this is God's work even if I don't understand it. He is still in control. Her blessing was not based on her circumstances. Her blessing was not based on her comfort with her circumstances. Her blessing was fixed by the Word of God, and she believed it. Mary didn't know. She didn't know the hard path that she was being asked to follow as part of God's blessing and calling in her life, but she was blessed. She surely didn't understand the twists and the turns that her life was going to take, the suspicion and poverty and widowhood and everything else that pierced her to her soul, as Simeon said it would, but she was blessed. She was chosen by God to bear his son into the world. You and I don't know. We don't always understand the hard paths that we are asked to tread, but we are blessed. We don't comprehend how a lost job, a prolonged illness, an unfairness in life, or even death can be a part of God's plan but we are blessed when we know him. We have been called to take the good news of his son into all the world. We are the most blessed of people. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then rejoice this Christmas morning in the certainty that even when you don't know what lies ahead or understand what is going on, you are most blessed and most highly favored by God. He has placed you under his grace. He has chosen you, and he lives within you to be used for his purposes. And if you have not placed your faith in Christ, if you feel lost and overwhelmed by the struggles of this life without purpose or direction, then allow the Christ of Bethlehem, to be born in your heart today. Ask him to come in to you. Ask his influence to grow within you and his salvation to be delivered not only to you, but through you to others. You may have more in common with Mary than you ever thought. You too will know his blessings, even if you don't know where he will lead or how he will get you there. Lord God, in this Christmas season, may we echo the words of Mary, we are your servants, do unto us as you have said. Mary, did you know that when Gabriel said that you were highly favored, Mary, did you know that when Elizabeth said that you were the most blessed. Did you know that you'd give birth in a cold, damp cave? That this would be the way God chose the world to save? Mary didn't know that God's favor would cost her reputation. Mary didn't know that from Nazareth word would spread across the nation. She didn't know that her little boy would one day face the cross, that the path of God's great victory would come at such a cost. Mary didn't know. Father, once again we come to you and we are on the cusp of a new year that truly is like looking through a windshield that's covered with frost. We have no idea what lies ahead. 
And we do our best to scrape away some so that we can get a little glimpse of what might happen and we try to make our plans and we try to think that we are in control. How foolish (laughs) for us to think that. But Lord, we know that the only hope we have is to trust in you because for you the night is as clear as day and you know the beginning from the end and you know the plans you have for us. And so guide us, Lord, as you guided Mary, not to easy times, not to even comfortable times, but to the place you needed her to be and wanted her to be, a place where she truly lived under your grace and under your blessing. Lord, we trust in you, even as she did, when we don't understand, but we know that you've got this. So guide us, Lord. And help us to have faith to trust in you, even when we don't know. Amen.